I'd like to thank the STS for the opportunity to present our surgical video on how to perform TAVR using transcarotid access. Here are my disclosures. Our technique will be illustrated in an 88-year-old female who had a prior CAVI JVR five years ago with a 21 millimeter trifecta. She was currently hospitalized with decompensated congestive heart failure and a failing prosthetic aortic valve with a mean gradient of 62 and patent bypass grafts. Her STS BROM was 16.6% and unfortunately she had inadequate iliofemoral access for valve and valve TAVR. Non-femoral TAVR access options with self-expanding valves at our institution include all of the following. However, heavy calcification in the abdominal aorta, iliacs, arch, and subclavian arteries, carotid access are the most favored option. To date, we have performed 60 TAVRs using transcarotid access utilizing both right and left carotid arteries and employing both self-expanding and balloon expandable transcatheter valves. This gives you a broader view of how the patient is draped with the C-arm opposite the side of the carotid access. EEG is used to determine if femoral to carotid shunting is required. However, to date, this has not been necessary in any of our cases. Cardiology establishes the necessary femoral access simultaneous to the surgeon exposing the common carotid artery at the level of the omohyoid muscle. A test camp was applied after heparinization to determine the need for shunting. We modify the delivery sheet by cutting it with a knife to shorten it. In the case of a self-expanding valve like we are using in this case, we use a gore dry seal. You can do the same to an Edwards E sheet. We access the carotid artery using a Selminger technique with care not to backwall the artery. An 035 wire is then inserted under fluoroscopy, followed by a six French sheet. The native or prosthetic valve in this case is crossed using either a JR4 or in this case an AL1 catheter and a Medtronic straight wire. The wire is exchanged for a pigtail catheter for left heart cath and hemodynamics. In this case, we had a gradient of 63 millimeters of mercury with a valve area of 0 0.6. The wire is exchanged with, for an extra stiff wire. All this is done through the six French sheath and with the carotid unclamped. After removing the six French sheath and with the distal carotid clamped, you're now ready to put in the delivery sheath by first making a transverse arteriotomy with an 11 blade and then finishing it with a pot scissors. You want to make sure that the wire is free within the arteriotomy and not subintimal. Once the arteriotomy is completed, the sheath and dilator are now advanced while slowly releasing the ramel, which allows the sheath to go in, in without much blood loss. This is what an Edward sheath looks like when it's secured, in this case, for a right carotid access. At this point, the self-expanding valve is deployed in a standard fashion. During valve and valve, we take the parallax out of the surgical valve rather than the device, but fluoro in several different views to ensure the valve circumferentially seats within the sewing ring. It's difficult with valve and valve to see whether you get your 
self-expanding valve too deep or not deep enough. As with many valve and valve tavers performed in small surgical valves, we expected and indeed had a significant residual gradient of 27 millimeters of mercury. If this were a breakable surgical valve, we would fracture the valve using a non-compliant balloon with a high pressure inflation. Observe the waste of the balloon release and the frame pop with fracture occurring at 18 atmospheres. Here is the fractured surgical valve demonstrated on a non-contrast CT one month after the procedure. In this case, the surgical valve was a trifecta whose titanium ring cannot be fractured. During previous bench testing, we observed that the struts of this valve were easily deformed with a balloon and could be bent outwards, thus allowing for more room and possible better expansion of the supervalvular component of the self-expanding valve. In this case, we applied this knowledge and post-dilated the trifecta valve with a 22 millimeter true balloon to 10 atmospheres. Notice how the balloon dog bones and by doing so pushes the surgical valve struts out. Although the inflow of the valve remains constrained in the unbroken frame of the surgical valve, the superannular transcatheter valve has slightly more room to better expand. Here, here is the trifecta before any intervention with the struts at 90 degrees to the sewing ring. Here is the valve after valve and valve taver and post dilatation. And now you can see the struts are pushed out to about 120 degrees. This ultimately resulted in a residual gradient decreasing from 28 to 13 millimeters of mercury in a valve area now of 1.3. The delivery sheath is now removed and the artery flushed. A side benefit of this technique is cheap embolic protection for the brain on the access side. The transverse arteriotomy is closed primarily and after, and after releasing the proximal clamp, we de-air with a 25 gauge needle and then re-establish flow to the brain. In conclusion, transcarotid access for the delivery of transcatheter valves or ascending or descending thoracic aortic stents is a useful technique for inclusion in the surgeon's armamentarium. As previously reported, transcarotid access is a less invasive option that results in shorter length of stay, reduced blood utilization, and more frequent discharge to home compared to more traditional non-femoral access options such as transapical or direct aortic. Continued investigation into the merits of bioprosthetic valve fracture or balloon manipulation of small surgical valves during valve and valve taver is warranted in order to optimize the hemodynamics and improve the poor outcomes when valve and valve taver is performed in small surgical valves.